Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to this webinar. Um, my name is Navtej Porewal and I am a professor here at SOAS. I teach um, Development Studies Department, but I'm also the module and program convener of International Development Online. Um, it's kind of a one-way conversation. I can see people who are logged on here and hear you. So we'll at the end have a, um, you can have, ask me questions through the, through the chat function. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have about the program or some of the things that I'm about to present to you. So what I thought I'd do today is give you a, a brief overview of um, at the end of the program, International Development. And I'd like to just, for those of you who, some of you may be already working in the inter international development sector, in which case you'll have a wealth of experience, no doubt, um, and may not have studied some of the things that you're, you've actually been doing. We have students who come in who are really wanting to get the more practical experience, having studied some parts or done sociology or politics or economics, but have, want to do a more specific and a focused program of study and want to go on and work. In them. So the session is going to be very brief, 15, 20 minutes. I'm going to be talking a bit about how development studies as a field can help us tackle some of the most cutting edge, pressing issues in the world. Um, I think it's really important. People come to SOAS because many students think that they're coming because they actually want to make a huge impact on the world, which is the reason why we're here. Um, I also want to talk about what possibilities does critical thinking in development studies enable? And I think that's the biggest reason that most of you ask people who come to SOAS to study, whether it's distance learning or on campus, it's because they actually want to have that, learn some of those skills around critical thinking to actually really make impacts on the world. Um, and then I want to give you an example of research-led teaching in international development. And I'm just going to give an example of some of the research that I've done and how I approach you know, a particular topic and how you might think of other areas that you might be interested in, how seeing how an idea can translate into the classroom and then can translate into some things that we, we might learn about in, in, in one of the modules that you will, will take. So I'll start off with critical thinking as an approach, a methodology, and a skill. Um, and this, this, these points are really targeted at, I think, the SOAS kind of ethos uh, which I think is quite different, and particularly around development studies. You could go anywhere and study development studies, but when you come to SOAS, you're coming to, to SOAS to really think quite deeply um, about some very fundamental issues and not merely looking at the kind of policy level or analysis level. So the first point is about thinking about the historical and political backdrops of development contexts and outcomes. So that can range from looking at conflict and war zones to even looking at every what had become normalized everyday contexts of deprivation, um, but actually considering how and why those contexts have emerged and, and looking at a number of different aspects to those. The second is this idea of reading between the lines and even going further and deconstructing development rhetoric and buzzwords. So even in one of my examples I'm going to be showing, is looking at the sustainable development goals as being potentially could be seen as a buzzword or a series of buzz, buzzwords. What do they actually mean? Um, and why is there sometimes resistance to some of the concepts that are hidden within the sustainable development goals? And you know, why what what institutions and which voices are represented in them? The third point is analyzing systems and structures which actually produce inequalities. I think this third one. I think is really, um, it's, it doesn't just sum up what, what happens, a lot of what happens at SOAS, but it also, it pinpoints the fact that many, and we don't just use kind of structuralist analysis or Marxist analysis, we use a number of different frameworks, but many of them are actually looking at not just the experience or outcomes of uh, uh, processes that produce inequalities, but it's actually looking at the systemic nature of them. And oftentimes that implicates institutions which are very much part of the status quo. Um, so that's where critical thinking comes in and how you can either think about changing institutions or challenging them in terms of what they represent. The fourth point is considering a range of diverse approaches. And in particular, many of you would have heard about the decolonizing curriculum uh, movement that began here, which has now become one of the um, 
kind of cornerstones of, of the ethos of SOAS now as well, is thinking about non-Eurocentric perspectives. And that's not just about having a diverse reading list, it's also considering what the world looks like sitting in different parts of the world and actually valuing different types of knowledge and different systems of knowledge. Even though you'd be coming to SOAS to study, which is in the middle of you know, the UK and London, has its own history of empire, it's also a really good place to sit and think you know, wherever you are in the world about the, the either look at the ongoing, the continuities, the impacts, but the ways in which this has operated on um, a number of different levels in terms of resistance to your European knowledge, but also in terms of new knowledges that are being produced. So it's a really exciting time in many ways to be a student, I think, at, at SOAS. And the final one is looking, is understanding how power influences development. So thinking about power and not just the experiences of, or thinking about the, the, the poor, for instance, but actually looking, going back to the point earlier, point three, is, not, is looking at power on the one hand, but also thinking about the systems that power also produces and institutes that can oftentimes perpetuate um, inequalities and other development issues. So some of the debates that we look at, for instance, in international development, the core module, um, political sociology and economics of development, economy of development, is that we, we look at things ranging from what, how do we measure po poverty and inequality and what do different measurements of poverty and inequality tell us. Some quantitative indicators will tell us one thing, qualitative assessments might tell us something else, and in between there are a number of different measurements that we'll be kind of looking at in a comparative critique. We also, if you would have heard of the concept of neoliberalism, which is basically this idea that capitalism, you know, is is triumphant. So if it is triumphant and it's everywhere, it is the system. Now, how how has it impacted on development policies? We're now talking about neoliberal development. You know, what does that actually mean? Another is the idea of colonialism uh, or of, of development actually being um, an ongoing. Uh, legacy of, of, of colonialism, that development began as part of, one people will say, as a part of the, you know, the colonial endeavor. The um, continuities could be seen as something that show that colonialism actually isn't the Western Eurocentric domination of knowledge and of policies and of institutions could be read in, through this lens. So we do a little bit on that. And then we also finally, what I'm going to be talking about today is looking at gender and um, gender, is it instrumentalized in development in discourse and policy? And actually, what does that mean to instrumentalize um, something like gender? Gender. So I'm just gonna just give you a very brief mini kind of session on this, which is kind of an area that, well, I teach this on campus as well as do research on this. And I thought this might be a good way of highlighting a kind of a way that we approach our, some of our, our topics in development studies. I'm going kind of referring back to the earlier slide, critical thinking about how we, um, why you might consider coming to SOAS to study development studies, is that if we want to have a critical approach to gender and development, and this isn't just saying having using women as a proxy uh, for gender, uh, it's also it's thinking about gender, how it how it functions in society, but also within development programs, courses that we would need to think about how gender historically has featured in development interventions, including what has been called the colonial civilizing mission, right? that it exports this idea of, of empowerment, so those buzzwords I mentioned, through um, you know, women's upliftment or their inclusion can oftentimes be read as, as ways in which that, that, that continuity is actually civilizing societies by uplifting these women or, or, cha or cha challenging gender in other societies. Another way of critically approaching is about, well, shouldn't we be questioning this idea of universal principles around, and this is making a full, that question is really turning back on 1995 when there was a late Beijing platform for action, we looked at, at CEDAW, the convention, for the elimination of discrimination against women, and a number of other frameworks, policy frameworks, which have tried and have been part of this international universal trying to universalize certain principles around equality, human rights, gender rights, is that necessarily um, something that should continue to be promoted or is it something that may require some um, 
more rigorous analysis to be applied um, in different contexts. I think that's quite a you know an ongoing question, nothing, nothing we can answer here, but something just to make you alert you to think about. And then what does mainstreaming signify in the Millennium Development Goals and now the Sustainable Development Goals? Is that a victory to have mainstreaming and say that yes, in order for development projects to come up and to be funded or to be successful, they need to show that they have mainstream gender and gender is very centrally being considered. Oftentimes there are things that are left uh, for instance, mainstreaming doesn't necessarily take an intersectional approach, so it might look at gender or women, but it may ignore other um, marginalizations or exclusions, such as ethnicity or class um, or region or the rural-urban divide. Another aspect we might consider is the backdrop of neoliberalism and Western hegemony within inter international institutions. Um, there are a lot that is said, has been said and can be said about how the, the rise and ascent of neoliberalism as the system um, has also been reflected in how Western institutions or Western-based inter institutions have really become um, the international framework of, of, of how capitalism now operates. This is really having a huge impact on how we should be thinking about development studies now. Um, and in fact, it's quite challenging for those of us who are teaching it now to actually follow development in ways because if we're looking at corporations now being development actors and partners, we're not just thinking about international institutions in the old sense, we're also now thinking about new actors who, are, who have vested interests, who are also investors, um, who also have to, have, to, have to be on the same platform within the develop, same development platform. So that's quite an interesting area that I'll be talking about in a minute. And finally, the emphasis on the individual and therefore rights through those platforms I just mentioned before can sometimes not necessarily be in sync with local contexts. And you can see those very polarized positions or even places in which human rights are seen as an imposition, as a Western imposition. Um, and you know how and why that those, those um, dichotomies um, are erected um, can oftentimes be not necessarily just about that issue, but what's going on more widely. So while a project is being introduced you know, to, to empower women, it's important to consider what else is going on around that, which may be instrumentalizing women in order for those other goals to be achieved. So I'm just going to highlight some examples here. I've given some images here around the top one is a Unilever ad around sustainable tea production, um, which is obviously showing these happy workers, women you know, working in a tea plantation someplace like in South Asia. And the bottom is, is looking at the colonial quantities around corporations being involved in that civilizing mission. And we see huge jumps being made, but also some continuities being made around how gender is featuring, how development is being um, talked about. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to talk through these because we don't have enough time. I just wanted to highlight the sustainable development goal number five which is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. And you can see very explicitly that this is mainstreaming, you know, to have gender have, and, and gender equality and empowerment of women and girls to be one of the SDGs being very much as a, as a victory for those who were um, you know, participating in, in the movement since the 1960s from women in development, women and development to gender and development, which were policy frameworks that, that victory had been, you know, been achieved by asserting it. And then further, the SDGs, how will these SDGs be achieved? And you can see here, you know, by undertaking reforms to give women equal rights, to enhance the use of enabling technology. And here we are communicating through technology here, um, thinking that, that it's going to be seen as a, as a key uh, component in the promotion of the empowerment of women. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a slide in a moment which relates to this. I and mean, then how are we going this? How is technology going to be part of this? Um, and the third is to adopt and strengthen sound policies and enforceable legislation, um, which shows another level of, um, which may require intervention or certain reforms in terms of legal frameworks and different national level policy contexts. So here's an example um, of, of, of gender policy and development is education, universalization of education. Um, so beginning in 1990 um, in Senegal, Dakar, the Dakar framework was drawn up where the whole principle that 
universalization of education, which makes it compulsory um, for primary education to begin with, was going to be rolled out on a global level. So that all, and according to the MDGs then, that, and then subsequently the SDGs, that all children would have access to primary education by 2015. Um, and so you can see SDG, the goal number four, sorry, the universalized the EFA goal four, which is to achieve gender parity by 2005 and gender equality by 2015, made it very explicit that gender was being mainstreamed in the education debate. And here's some, you know, we, we like to, you know, should not necessarily, oops, we're going ahead. Oh, it's going ahead. Sorry about this. There we go. And here we see the gender parity index. Gender parity index operates on a scale which shows 1.0 would be absolute parity between females and males, right? That would mean that we had achieved gender parity or equality. And actually what this graph is showing is that gender parity has more or less been achieved um, at the um, levels of, of, of primary, at the level of primary education, very high levels there. So many people will say universalization has more or less been successful. And it's here where, as we as students, as researchers, become, as teachers become interested in, well, actually, if you go back to the slides, uh, see goal number six was to improve the quality of education and this is where we see that there's there we're still lacking that out of that has emerged a number of different findings which show that despite people being in many cases you know they being compulsory to attend school that the quality hasn't necessarily followed. But what's even more underlying, so here's where we're reading between the lines, okay, going back to my earlier slide, is that we're thinking actually how is education now being structured, right? We are in neoliberal times. We have a lot of partnerships, private public partnerships that are emerging. So the global partnership for education is exactly that. It brings on um, companies, corporations, with international organizations, with NGOs, um, on a, a national governments um, together in terms of sharing platform and considering ways of, of, of um, developing uh, funding frameworks. Um, so then you can see here is an info, infographic which shows the improvements or the goals that have been set by the Global Partnership for Education. Perhaps even more interestingly, if you look at the bottom of the companies who are part of these types of partnerships, and this is the rise up. So, we have a number of different scales, particularly going back to gender and education, where the girl, the girl child, becomes a symbol for education and the victory for the kind of gender equality and gender mainstreaming um, uh, platform. And at the bottom, we have AstraZeneca, we have Packard, Ford Foundation, Gates, uh, Johnson & Johnson. Um, a number of different companies um, will girl rise, rise up, the girl effect, um, started by Nike, are, are showing that, in fact, the corporate sector is not just donating um, in terms of charity, it's now, in fact, shaping some of the development discourse that we're seeing emerging around education. And that should, that impacts on actually the types of policies that are being developed also. Now, when we now, we think, okay, well, here are the, the, the the, the, the types of actors who are involved in education and girls' education are, we could say on the one hand they're diversifying, but on the other we might say, in fact, these are vested interests and they're potentially conflict of interest. But we can, we can ask this big question then, if we're thinking about a just world, if we're thinking if we want justice or gender justice or, you know, justice through education, um, is that, well, does gender, global gender policy represent justice or injustice in this example around education? And for many people, it does not. Um, and for many people, it does. On the bottom, I've given a number of different images here, um, which either reference to Malala Yousafzai, obviously a very important symbol for girls' education, or Boko Haram, and the kinds of um, the, um, the hashtag bring back our girls, which became very, very uh, prominent in terms of social media. 
Those are not just statements that are made. Those tell us a lot about the political backdrop that's going on. While girls' education, and this is something that we look at um, in terms of the literature for this session when I teach it, is that we think about the common sense of girls' education. No one disagrees, by and large, that girls should be educated. It's something that kind of everyone's on board with. Um, and we might think to go beyond that is actually why would people be challenging this idea of, of, of sending girls or sending children to education? What else is going on in the world while well, these programs and policies are introduced? So what was going on in the world you know, in, the, in the mid 2000s, for instance, in which, which parts of the world were, were seeing conflict zones? Which parts of the world were receiving military um, assistance or those that were being you know, um, the site of occupation or being targeted? That What are the vested interests, therefore, which are aligned to the gender development agenda alongside that? So many would argue, so we have one reading for that, which talks about the common sense. It says the girl-child emerges around education as the kind of person that needs saving. She's a victim on the one hand, but she also highlights and justifies um, in Western intervention, whether it be through de development or through military intervention. So we can obviously look at Afghanistan. We can look at other parts of the world. The girl-child, in fact, is has been instrumentalized as um, a, a, as a symbol for foreign policy. Um, and we might then think about the kinds of discourses and symbols around the girl that further are used to kind of further, on the one hand, the gender justice rights agenda, and on the other, other types of interventions. So when I say what types of inter, what, uh, how, to what extent is, uh, can the girl, child, or is the girl being weaponized or instrumentalized, this is precisely what we're talking about. We're saying, well, girl education for all it sounds like a wonderful agenda and we're, we're on board. But who's involved? So the corporate sector so it gets involved and in places. So where Malala Yousafzai is from in Pakistan, 40% of children going to school at primary age are actually attending private schools. Um, and you also have private sector who are involved in the, in the global partnership for education. So there are vested interests there who are not only um, giving um, to this cause, but are also profiting from it. And I think those are the systems and structures that I was mentioning earlier that we are really interested in highlighting, is how much is being given, who's giving the money where, um, and you know, what are the cycles of, of investment and profit, and ideologically, how does this work? So I'm just going to highlight this quickly. I've got a little um, documentary clip here, Nike and the sweatshop problem on the left. Okay, so Nike as a company launched the girl effect. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting literature on this, which analyzes. On the right, you see the Nike Foundation sponsored coalition for adolescent girls, where you see this triangle. And at the bottom of the triangle, kind of holding the entire frame up, um, is the girl. You know, she's abstracted through this international sign, um, and she's carrying the weight of the population. Um, and in the, in the process, making her the most powerful person in the world. Um, she's also featured as being and represented as being the most dispossessed. And so this image was designed you know, for the Nike Foundation as it was being criticized, um, and highlighted by campaigners because of its, its so-called sweatshop problem. There's a lot of documentation of Nike's um, practices in terms of production. Um, how it operates in special economic zones where it doesn't have to pay a uh, minimum wage or abide by labor laws um, and, and, and the, the violations it makes in those in terms of its production, they needed to find a way of kind of laundering their reputation um, and basically how they did it was through their corporate social responsibility campaign. So the girl effect was precisely that. The girl child enabled a company like Nike and other companies who are doing this also, which we, we can highlight. Uh, Vodafone has done this in terms of mobile phone um, uh, promotion in, in, in parts of Africa and South Asia. And that relates to the technology point of the SDGs. That actually the corporate agenda has been, in some ways gets embedded in ways that oftentimes really go unnoticed. Uh, so I think these are the kinds of issues that we are interested in thinking about. They're not just about people who are marginalized and therefore need help, but we also need to be looking at the marginalized in relation to 
power in, in relation to the kind of systems of production, in terms of the, the systems um, of, and, and flows of, of, of profit, investment, and also development. So just basically to, to sum up, and I'm just going to go back now to the program, to the MSc in International Development Online, you know, that, that example is just kind of in a nutshell, um, the way in which we could approach uh, gender and education question. Um, I do research in that area, so I sometimes then go into some of my field work and the kinds of findings we've made in that area and, and, and draw on other studies. Um, you know, and, and the different types of lectures you'll attend online and, and the, the readings you'll do are very engaging. And so basically the online MSc International Development Program is based on a number of different principles. The SOAS ethos of progressive critical thinking and development studies, as I've tried to highlight here, um, it has a very unique pedagogy, which is um, very much student-centered. It's inclusive, it's accessible, it's user-friendly, it's flexible, and you know it allows you to people who are working alongside that there isn't a set time where you have to attend a lecture as you are today. Um, but it's, for instance, this is recorded so you could watch it another time, but the resources are there for you to follow um, as, as it kind of suits your, your, your schedule in, within the cycle. Um, the program also equips students with skills and knowledge to engage with important issues. So such as the one I, I mean, I'm interested in this, I began to think, well, what are we doing with this new framework of neoliberal development? If people are talking about it, what does it actually mean? Um, you know, I'd hope students who are coming to South Africa study will do this in their, in their dissertations also. It's finding something that really catches your interest, something that you're really committed to and interested in doing, or a range of different questions that you're interested in doing through your essays and really learning how to apply the knowledge that you learn through the readings and through the discussion forums with your with your peers and developing those kind of critical communication skills and thinking skills as well as writing. So the aims of the distance learning um, MSc are um, there are a number of them to give you a thorough and interdisciplinary political understanding of processes of change in developing regions. Um, we also kind of turn the looking glass the other direction also, as I said, in terms of looking, looking in the face of power. So corporations are also part of that, but also looking into, in terms of development as it's known more traditionally. We also um, aim to give a specialized knowledge of a particular, a particular studies. Um, just to highlight, to, to give you illustrations of the kind of sometimes abstract theories and just how they're operating in the real world. And then also like the, the gender parity thing I showed you, the, the graph, um, as well as showing you some overall trends. Um, we also aim to impart skills to think in policy relevant terms. So you're cognizant of the kinds of policy frameworks that are out there that you should be aware of while also thinking about the maybe more academic literature, more theoretical literature, and being able to, to consider that alongside. Um, and finally, to, to give you analytical skills um, and an understanding of practical methodologies to proceed to professional employment. And possibly some of you may end up wanting to go on to do further research. So the core module we have is the political economy and sociology of development. Um, and it has three main kind of uh, components. Um, one is the battle of ideas, which we go through a number of different kind of theoretical frameworks and paradigms and kind of consider them alongside one another and in conversation with one another and oftentimes in conflict with each other, where you might find as in your discussion forums, which we have through the chat function with your, with your colleagues, with your peers, is actually engaging in academic log. And I think that's a really useful skill to be able to develop. Um, many students find um, that the discussion forum, and I think my experience of seeing it is that I have students on campus in tutorials who meet face to face. Students who are on the discussion forum um, are also discussing with one another. And in many ways, it's, you, you, you're having a more sustained engagement because the tutorial for a particular topic will carry on for that entire week. Um, so it's a very, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very engaging um, kind of pedagogy, the ways in which we encourage students to, um, I mean, not just encourage, you know, you have to participate in the, in the weekly forums. The second theme is whose development. Um, and, and while you'll still be going in and discussing these topics with each other, this component is, is slightly more applied in, in considering 
you know, some questions around you know, the measurements, as I mentioned earlier, different measurements of ways of assessing development, um, you know, considering how poverty appears at the national level um, and how international level frameworks, you know, may be adequate or inadequate to, to assess and some of those debates. And of course, the gender and development paradigms that are available. The final one is, is shaping development, um, which is kind of really now considering some real substantive um, cutting edge areas for you to apply some of the previous three, previous two, sorry, areas. Um, thinking about, you know, industrialization, agriculture, labor markets, um, considering planning, thinking about taxes, um, you know, thinking about how how NGOs operate actually, um, and many people work in the in the, the NGO sector, um, or you know work in different kinds of aspects of, of, of development, in which you have to think critically around you know what what should what is the role of NGOs and actually how are they positioned? I mean particularly within the context I was mentioning earlier, an era in which the you know, funding funding context, international agencies, corporations, or a number of different actors that are at play in the same space, you know, what is the role of NGOs? So we ask a number of those kind of quite deep, deep questions um, in, in that component. And so what the, mon the overall program looks like is that you have the core module, which I just mentioned, political economy, social development. Then you have what we have called guided modules, but they're actually just modules that are from our list, from the development studies list. Um, they're not any more guided, actually, than others. Um, they're just more within the discipline. You get an elective module from a much broader list, which are offered in other departments. And then finally, the dissertation and development studies, which also um, has um, many modules that help guide you through the dis dissertation process. And that is the end of my presentation. I'd like to you know, welcome anyone who wants to have, who has any questions or has any comments, anything you'd like to ask, I'd be more than happy to, to answer. If you're interested in the program, you're welcome to um, email me. I've got my email on the first slide. I'd be happy to, to discuss anything that you may have, any questions that you might have. Yes, okay. Deo Gracias has asked, I joined aid was the session recorded? Yes, it's being it's been recorded and you should be able to it's still being recorded, I think. So you'll be able to see an audio copy. I think you just probably onto the onto the onto the web page for this. Um, and it should be there. Um, if not, you can you can email me and I can send it. Okay, Stacer has said about speaking about the student community in this program. Yeah, so the student community is very interesting. Um, so I've been teaching on campus for a while at SOAS, and I've done other distance learning programs. The development studies is, why I'm saying it's interesting, is it's very diverse, um, but it goes beyond that. I find that, and I don't know all of you who are attending this today, but the students who, who, are, do, who do the international development or do these programs tend to be people who are of, are already um, have already have a, quite a bit of experience um, so you don't have many people who are coming straight from university having done an undergraduate degree many people who have gone straight through and gone into an international development agency for instance and are actually working in the countries where you know, they they're there basically and and don't have that Ability of taking time out for further study. So you end up having some very interesting conversations and discussion forums. People who are, I mean, this year, right now, people are just finishing this first cycle of the political, uh, political sociology economy development. And they are I mean, ranging from New York City to Damascus um, to Nairobi to, I mean, you, they're all over the world. And the, I think the biggest challenge is not so much about people coming from different places or um, communication. It's actually just the time, the time difference people have to kind of, you know, you're, you're all in the same, you know, you're on the same cycle for the week. A topic will be announced on the forum and everyone has to participate in it. Um, and so what you realize is that it's, it's, it's properly global. Um, so it, it's an interesting experience I, I found. Um, it's quite enriching because you'll hear in the introductions in the first week, people will speak about themselves and kind of where you've been, 
um, you know, why you're interested in doing the program, and you, you kind of get a sense immediately from the first week, um, it almost feels as though people by the end really know each other quite well because the discussion forums, they kind of force you to participate in ways which, you know, you engage with the topic, but you're also kind of sharing your, your um, analysis and, and perspective as well. So it's quite a professional, a lot of professionals, a lot of people who are though going straight through and actually just want to get knowledge. So yeah, my email, so okay, Fatala is asked for my email and it's on the slide. I'm just showing now if you can see it. If I compare the online, one I'll just preempt a question. If I compare the online with the on-campus students, I think, um, and I've attended graduation as well where online students have come. Um, you, you do see, just, maybe I won't say more mature students necessarily, but you could say that. You could also say, yeah, you just have a range of different kinds of professional backgrounds people are coming from. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not, it's in no way, distance learning is no way um, like a, 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 a second rate option or something, easy option either. It is very much on par with doing any other kind of program on campus and in, in other ways you might say it's actually more engaging because you really you know you're not you're not missing classes you know you have to attend because you have to attend online so you're very present there and it's with you so it, it's just a commitment also um, to do the readings and to keep up so let me has asked for a certificate after the session do you mean do you mean this session no i'm afraid not I mean, you, if anyone wants to apply for the for the program, you can say that you, you know, you you, you attended this for this webinar on the on this date, and you can you can write that into your personal statement if you like, if that's if that's of any help. I don't have the full list of them. I didn't do it on purpose, thinking that you probably would be able to access it online anyway. Um, so this is this this is the structure of the of the program. If you go to the, the web page, right, for, for the MSE International Development online, you'll see a list of modules that you can choose from, which is quite extensive. This is just the structure, which is which just kind of shows you that you have basically three options. <laughs> if that to, to make it more simple, you have three options. These two are from a slightly more narrow list, which is development kind of more development studies. And this one is from the elective module, is more from a broader list. You can also get in touch with module, you know, conveners if you want any more specific information when you're choosing them. That's a good question around the difference between the program, these two programs, humanitarian and international development. Humanitarian studies is more, yeah, I mean, it's 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 actually all in the core module. I think that's probably what distinguishes them the most. But also the dissertation. I think for the dissertation, you probably would would focus on. on some kind of humanitarian um, related topic, um, but that's it basically. I mean, think in terms of your electives, you're more or less very similar, very similar. But the core module, the, the political economy, the political sociology one, um, yeah, is very much like a, a development studies kind of core module. So you know, it covers some of the more yeah the, the, the kind of debates that you would expect a development studies student to have been exposed to. So it's the post-development debates, the decolonial, um, you know, neo-Marxist versus Marxist, and structuralism and those, but then also kind of some broad development areas, whereas the humanitarian one is very much around humanitarian conflict studies. And that's a very particular kind of, yeah, that, that literature. I think it might be worth attending that one. I think it's on the 17th of February to get an idea of which one is, is more suitable for what you want to do. Most people who are making that choice tend to do so on the basis of two things. One is the core module, and the other is their professional plans. If any people are ever in London as well, we find I've met a few students who do the who've done who are doing the distance learning who are actually in London. Um, so those of you who are far away might think that sounds ludicrous, but actually it suits them because they many of them are, are working full time, and they are or, or are working full time and also traveling abroad. Um, so they often will they'll come in. They can they you can get a library card and they they can access the library in that way and have, have attended some of the of the seminar series um, that we have our development study seminar series. So that you're welcome to do that as well. 
it may, it may be that the humanitarian action program might be more tailored to what you need. The way to decide is if, if, if you feel as though um, the political sociology economy module has enough of a broad background for you, but you, could, you can take some of the other modules um, as options um, apart from the humanitarian um, core module. So you'd really have to decide, I think, at this stage, whether you feel that having that focus is important for you. Um, and, and actually how you, well, how you understand your interests or how you understand those problems, right, to change them. I think it's only you that will, but maybe the you know, health, if you're interested in health in particular, or if you're interested in conflict and humanitarian action, then it may be that the humanitarian action program will be more, more suited to you. Okay. So, I mean, I can only speak, so this, we're, 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 we've just launched this program. I've been teaching on another program, which has been in international studies and development, um, sorry, diplomacy. Um, and that, those students have, have gone on to do, um, they work in, into the international development sector by and large. I mean, that's what most people end up doing. Um, and I think it's just the nature of where the jobs are. Um, some people actually set up their own um, I've met a few people who've done that as well, gone on and decided that they actually, whatever they've learned, they felt that they wanted to set something else up in, you know, in a vision that they felt was more in line with the things that they, the things they'd learned. But I think at the international development sector is where most people end up finding themselves working. And obviously the UN agencies. Um, we also have a really good careers office here. Um, as a student, while you're here, um, you know, you, you're able to, take advantage of some of those lists and recruitment and advertisements that come up through there. So that's, that can be quite helpful as well. Us obviously is, is quite well connected in, in, in terms of international development in that way. Um, but yeah, there isn't one, one route. Um, I, I mean, I think research going on to do an MPhil PhD is also not an unheard of ch choice after doing this program as well. So yeah, but this particular program is new. So We'll only know next year what where people go on to. And before I answer these, I think one of the main things you should be alerted to is the importance of the personal statement. And, and, and obviously it's you know grades and academic background and all of that for a master's program but for an MSc in particular, but also like what you're interested in doing a program like this is. Um, the connection between the kind of area um, you know, where you see your life going or your past experiences have led you to this. I think that can also strengthen your application. Okay, so like, can an online master offer real skills? To yeah, okay, sure. So the, the, there, and I, as I was saying before, there is, there is no difference really between an ma online master's degree and an on-campus one. We're moving towards an era where even our on campus, we're using kind of blended learning where a lot of things are online now. So even when people are attending and, and in big cities, it's not easy to get into you know, central London or you find that actually students are accessing so much of the information and, and the skills are, they're accessing skills in some ways by having those kind of skills around technology. Um, I think the one thing that's different about the kinds of skills that you gain online versus being on campus and that might be something that we work with for next year. Um, perhaps your cohort will benefit from it. Um, is the face-to-face -face interaction, you know? Um, but what you do gain is that, yes, no. There's, there are fees to be paid for this <laughs> for the program. Sorry. Yeah. So the, I'm going to go back to Saidani's um, question, which is around the skill, these real skills. The real skills you get are up for communication, are then for the discussion forum which is really interactive. When I watch the messages coming through and you can see people are responding to each other, one person has responded, they've read these and they write respond, the next one coming in, da, 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 right? Whereas a tutorial, if we book a tutorial on campus, it's one hour, right? And you'll see some people next week for an hour, very contained conversation um, and it ends there. Whereas you'll find on the online, that communication is carrying on. So the communication skills around debate and dialogue, all of that, and analytical skills are, are, are quite high there, I think, in terms of how people develop. Um, and obviously the dissertation is another place 
learning skills, which is mandatory, as Saidani has asked. Thesis, they have to do a master dissertation is, is compulsory. It's a part of it. It's worth 60 credits, so it, it's worth quite a bit. Um, and, and we do have like a mini modules, which are kind of dissertation research training kind of modules that are part of that. Um, so that's, that's that. In terms of internships, that kind of we don't have them as part of the part of the program. Um, but as a SOAS student, you would have access to the careers uh, office here. So there may be or who are always advertising internships. So you could take advantage of of having that kind of um, access. Right. So if anyone has any other questions, you can. You're welcome to email me. Um, I can try and answer any questions that you have. I need, we need to go. I think this room is about to be booked at three o'clock. Um, well, thank you all for your questions and for attending. I hope it was, hope it was helpful. Okay. I look forward to your applications.